Welcome to everyone on the live stream to Talent Fest 2021. Feel free to add your comments and questions to the chat. I'm Reefa, Chief Marketing Officer at Wired Sussex. Please check out all our latest digital media and tech jobs on the Wired Sussex Jobs Board. We're hosting events all this week to boost our region's thriving digital industry, helping businesses hire, nurture and keep the most talented people, the people we need to grow and deliver great work. So thank you so much to our sponsors, Legal and General, MPB and Plus Accounting and supporters Make Real and Sussex Chamber of Commerce. We really hope you enjoy this session. Check out our website, wiredsussex.com to see the other exciting events we have on this week. It's nearly over, so you've got to get in there quick. Let's meet our leadership panel. Um, welcome to Jonathan. Tell us a bit about yourself and your name, your company, what you do, and then we'll Hi, get uh, to some questions. <laughs> okay, no worries. Well, thank you. Um, firstly, thank you for inviting me to be part of the panel. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm John Malley, and I'm um, the Managing Director at um, Creative Agency We Are Tilt in Brighton. Um, as an agency, we're dedicated to creating um, lasting positive change through the work that we do. Um, and we work with some of the world's biggest businesses to help develop kind of capability, culture and communications. Um, as for me, I've got a bit of an eclectic past. I sort of come from um, in, in a past life. I come from being a water sports instructor um, and then I did a degree in marketing and that intersected with sort of, I guess, um, the birth of sort of HTML newsletters and blogging, sort of showing my age here. Um, and um, from there, I sort of went on a journey of sort of self-taught discovery or into web development. Um, meeting like-minded creative individuals, form Tilt, we developed Tilt, and as the business has grown, I've rapidly de-skilled in web development as I transitioned into management, um, and we are where we are today. Um, one of the things people don't know about me is that I have about circa 70% hearing loss, um, completely deaf in my right ear, and about 15 to 20% in my left. Um, so the question, has this affected me? Sure, it has. Um, but, um, you know, through, I guess I see my disability now, not necessarily as a disability, but as a kind of reason to look at the world differently. Um, it's important to note that that's been a choice, something I've had to, had to work on. Um, and so I design my interactions at work, home, socially, um, with kind of conscious mindset, ensuring that I post myself in environments that are things that I can control and thus feel comfortable in. Um, so, you know, whilst I might be able to disguise this deafness, I believe it's important to speak up um, and when meeting new people um, to ensure that they're aware of it um, so they can adjust their behavior accordingly as I adjust mine. So I, I kind of, you know, for me, looking at it from my limited sort of perspective, that's just kind of inclusion personified. It's adjusting behavior to make sure that everyone feels valued, feels listened to and feels included. Um, and that sort of, I guess, underpinned how we built Tilt, um, sort of having that inclusive mindset set at the core, um, just seek, seeking to make sure that everyone has sort of the opportunity to shine, really. Um, that's me. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Let no. me come to Mariam. Hello, my name is Mariam Crichton. I'm the group Managing Director of Four Earth Intelligence. Our vision is to, we use space data for the betterment of humans and the planet. We use satellite imagery to map environmental change, helping companies with their transition to net zero and um, climate change adaptation and yeah, change intelligence from space. And you're also tell us about how you you're in this space in in this space space <laughs> you are the only woman woman of color ceo is that right yeah yeah yes actually we did the research when it happened and there's not many because we we intersect the geospatial sector which is a niche in um, in the tech sector and then we're in earth observation remote sensing specialists which is a niche within that niche and we cross that geospatial and space sector and in both sectors space and geospatial you don't get many women at all so um oh definitely not in leadership as well um so yes i'm um 
a bit different. In many ways, Marianne, we'll come to that <laughs> later. Thank you so much. That's awesome. So let's hear from Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Weaver. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me. It's really exciting to be on this panel. Can't quite believe it. <laughs> um, I'm so I'm Michelle Steele. Uh, I work at a company called Avalara, um, whose um, EMEA headquarters are in Brighton. Um, but they're a worldwide company that specializes in um, helping companies with tax compliance. So sales tax, especially um, trying to get companies to help file their returns and that kind of thing, which is uh, more interesting than you think. <laughs> and I don't know that much about tax, but I do know, you know, how to um, do software and, and sort of tech stuff. So my background, actually, um, I actually studied engineering, mechanical engineering, because um, I was more interested in the physics side, but I ended up doing computer science. And I'm quite glad of that career choice. Uh, I think it's really, uh, you know, grown so much in the 25 years I've been doing it. Um, so I, I was a software engineer um, and kind of working with um, mechanical, but then also civil and GIS and now sort of office and maybe business to business. Um, and then this year in the company I was working at, I um, took a leadership role for the first time which was scary. <laughs> um, it's going well so far. Um, I kind of feel like as maybe, you know, something about me is that I'm trans. So uh, being a trans woman, I felt a little bit worried about taking something like a leadership role in some ways, you know, but I think it's really important for minorities to step forward and take those leadership roles and, and be open as well about um, their status or, you know, that's something that I, I'm still struggling with because it feels like you're always coming out. Uh, but when I first came out, maybe, you know, eight years ago in a job, I was already in that, at that stage where my CV was quite built up. And so I had a certain amount of privilege. And it's just quite interesting um, in terms of gender and the way people's biases kick in, even though they're well-meaning. Um, and it's something I very much noticed. Um, so, yeah, that's more or less about me I, I also involved in sort of coaching and stem um, volunteering and so on i'm also a volunteer at trans pride brighton as a volunteer um so coordinating a bit fantastic michelle thank you are you also a volunteer at, uh, where you've mentored at cobar as well haven't you in the past yes yeah right? cobar's great i want to talk a little bit about cobar later please do we just hosted um this week, as part of Talent, the Code Bar uh, Brighton, one of their first ones, I think, since lockdown. And being in a room with so many people, under for those of you that don't know, Code Bar Brighton is the, one of the branches of Code Bar, which is now a national charity that helps underrepresented groups get into the tech and digital sector by teaching them how to code and design as well. So they get matched up with a mentor. And just to see that, like almost like after school club for adults you know that they all kind of socialize together as well and see that amazing mix of people in Brighton was really fun to be just to be a small part of that I should say one of the reasons that I've put this panel together is because we have in the past at talent uh, festivals over the years got lovely DNI uh, diversity and inclusion experts to come and talk to us about what we should be doing as business owners about um, diversity and some of them will be in the audience as well. So I'm sure we'll get some questions from them and some comments from them. But this panel is a little bit different because we're getting to hear from our own personal experiences of working in the industry as leaders, as speakers, as people representing our various different um, groups that we represent just naturally, um, but also just who we are as people. So that we're all trying to sort of do the best that we can do with the resources that we have available at the moment. So Chris Ricketts spoke at um, Talent 2018, wasn't it? With the one that I organised at the Dome um, with, yeah. and you were talking, well, let's hear from you. How are you, Chris? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. I'm good. Uh, yeah, just like to introduce myself. My name's uh, Chris Ricketts. I, um, I'm basically the director and founder of 1010 Consultancy. We're uh, basically a consultancy that works with uh, tech and digital businesses to help them create cultures where their people can be happy, do their best work and uh, build great careers. So that's that, That's the line. Um, 
basically I, um, my background is I've probably worked in around learning and development, talent development, leadership development for more years than I care to uh, actually confess. Uh, and the last role that I did, I was working for eBay um, and I was responsible for uh, talent, leadership development, culture, that kind of stuff across their businesses in the EU and for their classified businesses, which is stuff like uh, Gumtree and StubHub. Um, so, yeah, and I think probably the, some of the context for me here is that I, um, I set up Turn 10 in 2017 uh, and it was, you know, it's, you know, it's like setting any new business. There's quite some tough times involved a lot of work. Uh, it took me realistically probably a couple of years to really get it off the ground, get some clients, begin to build it. Uh, then in early 2019, I had a, I was going out uh, like Jonathan is. I think Jonathan's a keen mountain biker as well. I was uh, trying out a new mountain bike in Stammer Park, you know, just going out for a casual ride and uh, had a really bad crash. And um, unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, basically sustained a spinal injury. And I'm now paraplegic in a wheelchair. So I've been adjusting to uh, life as, as, you know, someone in a wheelchair and someone with a disability, which has been, you know, quite a transition. So, yeah, that's me. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, so many people in the tech community in Brighton love mountain biking. So uh, we were going to talk a bit more about what happened and uh, how, you know, how you're adjusting um, a bit later as well. So, I mean, I should introduce myself as well. I am, as well as Chief Marketing Officer at White Sussex, I am probably better known as the person who runs She Says Brighton in uh, part of the global network of getting more women in tech in in, um, and it has had an impact in Brighton. We've got 2000 members. And alongside that, we run Spring Forward Festival, which happens every March. And in 2018, I think I started with some other women, a women of color group in Brighton, which has spiraled out of control. We have now over 700 women of color um, in this Facebook group. And what I found was really interesting is that the, the curve or the interest in digital companies in is in the people of color thing is in diversity is the same as she says where technical companies would say to me people say oh you know we can't get the women we can't get women to apply we don't know any women women aren't coming to our events we can't get any women speakers and they just needed to expand their networks like that so chris was asking about you know like where do where do businesses start you know how do we how do we start with things? It's just an awareness. And usually it's with gender. And then I realized that also people of color in Bryce people make that same excuse in the last few years. You know, we can't find them. They don't exist. Where are they? And so that's why I started to look at my own groups with my own people around me and where are my people of color friends? And that's how that group started. So it's become quite an interesting resource for everybody within the group as well, but you know, and also to match people with different jobs and opportunities. So Jonathan, tell me, have you got? I've got something to say there. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I thought I was just, oh, hang on. Yes, that's fine, on my hand. Um, sorry, tech fail. Um, so we're talking about sort of uh, yeah, attracting um, women into sort of into the, the digital workspace. Um, and I actually got a real world example, um, which I think is quite pertinent to say here as well, which is you know, back in to, uh, early 2020, um, we were recruiting a new senior strategist. Um, and so I, I personally, um, you know, wrote the job specification um, and, you know, I sort of wrote it, you know, trying to be all empowering, saying, you know, you've got to be, you, you must be awesome at being creative, you must think outside the box, doing all of the usual things that you write when you write a job spec. Um, and it was not until later that when I, um, after we put this person into role, that um, I found out that she didn't actually apply until after um, the job, uh, the, the application had ended. And even then took a huge amount of courage to kind of you know, send her application in um, because she um, admitted she has low self-esteem and didn't feel like she met, she ticked those boxes of the things I was putting on the job spec. Um, and actually, she's amazing. She's been fundamental to, um, you know, our growth over the past two years. So I guess the, the, the lesson for, for, for me there as, as a leader is, you know, it, I could have missed out on that through simple wording of a job specification. And a, a, you know, a, a lesson from us there is, you know, 
don't just, I'm not going to, I will no longer write this just from my perspective um, when I'm writing job specs. It's, you know, make sure that I um, garner opinions from a, a cross section of people across the board so that I am sure, I ensure that when I push these, these specifications out and I push these adverts out, that I am speaking to a, as wide an audience as possible. So it's just a, you know, there's a, a perfect example of how, you know, you can innocently write something, think you're doing it with the best intentions and immediately exclude 50% um, of, <laughs> of your potential applicants. We've got the Wired Sussex Diversity Toolkit. And on that, there's a, there's a, um, a tool that you can use to run your copy for job ads um, in order to see the biases so it's a bit like Grammarly but it's for it's for gender bias so that's a really useful tool but also you had people in your own in your own teams didn't you that said to you uh Jonathan you know like they re rewrote some of the wording yeah <clears throat> yeah exactly so they, they actually helped me rewrite it and it went you know subsequent ads have gone out and uh, you know you've seen results so it's great so it's um it's I guess that's the one of the many benefits of um, you know, leading a, di a diverse and inclusive team is you have a broader um, uh, insight and broader opinions. You can garner you know, a wider remit of opinions and you can speak to, speak to more people. And how did you feel when someone criticised your copy? Um, I mean, that, that that's the other thing is like, um, you, I think, eh, start again. Obviously, when people critique your work, you it will it will affect you. It will cut you deep. But you have to also just leave your egos at the door and embrace a growth mindset. Basically, that's that's the mindset you need to have. You need to be in a state of continuous learning. Nothing is ever finished. And so, if you embrace that mindset, then everything's in first draft always, and it's always it can always be evolved and built upon. Um, and if you embrace that mindset, then you embrace criticism, not criticism, constructive criticism and feedback. And, you know, you've got to always seek feedback. I feel like um, sometimes people are really worried to talk about diversity or even to attempt to start um, because they don't want to get things wrong. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the worry. And I remember going through a similar journey with like uh, pronouns and worrying about people's pronouns and, uh, getting things wrong with trans and non-binary people. Michelle, do you want to explain a bit about pronouns and how that works? Um, yeah, a pronoun what? is... <laughs> Can you hear me? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, it's quite simple, isn't it? If someone says, I want to be addressed as he, she or they, then it's only polite to use those terms. And um, if you get it wrong, uh, okay, just move on, you know, just just correct yourself and move on. There's no need to make a big deal out of that. I think in terms of um, recruiting, it's especially difficult for, uh, well, I'm not saying, you know, there's like a prize for the most difficult person, but for trans people and non-binary, it's tough because, um, you know, going into interviews and things and having to explain your pronouns is, is quite a weight on people's shoulders. So I think there needs to be some understanding there and just, you know, I'm not sure how you get that across in, in the recruiting stage, but really there shouldn't be that problem at the recruiting stage. Um, yeah, I'm interested as well about um, what Jonathan said. I totally agree, you know, that it's in the wording and so on, but also how you circulate these kind of job ads, you know, where, where do they go? Are you just using one platform like LinkedIn or are you using agencies or are you, um, connecting with the community and maybe talking to some of the groups that, that help with diversity and, and trying to get those kind of opportunities out that way. Um, yeah, I'm interested if any, anyone's doing that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I mean, from from our perspective, um, I know obviously we 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 go through the very the, the, a variety of channels obviously we, we go through the various jobs boards so we use the wired sussex jobs board we use things like creative pool jobs board and sort of it's nice that jobs etc um, i know there's um a facebook group called digital toss which we sort of um we we advertise on which is great and then also um it is fundamentally important to um embrace the power of networks so um you know i, I 
it's it's never it's it never comes from me um the it's you speak to your various heads of department and they are building up their networks with it and they then go and speak to their um the, the, the contacts who exist in their circles um and they can draw people in so um quite a lot of the time it's through recommendations or words of word of mouth or sort of you know seven degrees of separation that you find an application coming in rather than um going down traditional routes but it's it all all feeds in there there are also now specific groups for uh, which do have job boards so like codebar now has you know its own jobs board uh, there's the other box which is a from the creative industries they're based in london run by people of color and so they have a jobs board as well for creative industries and it's just trying to get your message out wide mm. and far isn't it and there's also yeah. poc in tech there's loads of resources on our on our board sorry it's go on it's also about um, you know embracing all of the various events that happen within um, Brighton and or, or whatever town you, you exist in. Um, so, for example, we have directly placed people as a direct result of being involved in Codebar because um, I think we hosted a couple of events, um, and also um, Brighton Digital Festival, having the um, the open open studio, um, people coming in, having conversations. Those conversations evolve, and it's just about being open, I guess, to conversations and just new experiences brilliant thank you so much um Marianne let me bring you in like how how are you finding recruitment because you're recruiting on a global scale yeah so again as as uh, Jonathan was saying networks you know I happen to be in this women in geospatial group which was like 600 last year grown to nearly 3,000 and it's women all around the world of every seniority. And I always, always, if I know there's a job that's been out, I'll, I'll just copy and paste it into the Slack group for the women in geospatial. Um, so recruitment, we're actually 40% women in our company, which is unheard of in, in our sector. Um, and when it comes to um, attracting diverse candidates, I, I would say the most important thing is to have diversity in your leadership and for those leaders to, through their own uh, networking, social media, to talk about their diversity, because not all diversity is visible. So, and I think when people, um, when people can see um, that there is somebody diverse in the leadership team, then they feel like if they join that company, there's a certain kind of psychological safety there. So actually, I, I noticed we had a few um, new people come in and I said, oh, so how did you find out about us? Why did you join us? Um, one month after people start, I try and say hello. And I think three people in a row in the last last people I've met who knew that joined the company have all said, we saw your your LinkedIn post, Mariam. And so as a consequence, that's um, more women and more people of colour um, from around the world are joining because they've visibly seen me do things on LinkedIn. And that that's exactly that's exactly what um, having a somebody diverse on your interview panel can help with as well. And things like I was saying about um, the pronouns before, you know, the reason I mention it is because somebody was if all of us were visible with our pronouns on our signatures and on our uh, Twitter for handles, for example, then it doesn't become an issue for trans people who want to identify in a certain way. So if we're all saying we're all, this is our gender. But other people may not understand why that's important. But if it's just another signal to say, I'm an ally, I have, I, I welcome trans people, I don't mind what your gender is. And if they see our faces on the, our team profiles on the boards, so in 2018, one of the things that Wise Sussex did straight away was diversify their board. So Marianne Crichton is now on our board at Wise Sussex, and we have LGBTQ people represented, and we have um more women than ever before so well that's that's one step forward to start thinking about who's on your board who's in the room which is something um actually sarah pixnall spoke at she says brighton who's an advocate for diversity mostly for inclusion for disability rights and she says whenever you're doing anything think about who's not in the room so um did you want to add anything else mario 
Yes, I'd like to just, um, you know, yes, I am, I forgot to mention, I'm on the Wide Sussex board as a non-exec. And um, it's such a brilliant board. It's quite a big board. I can't remember how many of us, 10 or so on the board. And we do have such a variety of people represented. When you're sitting at the board meeting, it's so powerful because it's not just, you know, male, female, person of colour type thing. It's the, I find what's most powerful is the, the difference in ages from somebody in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, people with different um, generations all in a room and the different backgrounds we come from. Um, it's absolutely amazing to sit in the boardroom and because we're all so comfortable with each other, it's a big group, it's a very diverse group, but that comfort makes us feel like, you know, that you never hesitate to share your opinion no matter what it is. That's fantastic. Um, Chris, I'm going to come to you because um, we, don't, we really want to hear a bit more about how you've been transitioning into uh, a new way of working and a new way of being. Um, is that OK for us to hear a bit more about your situation? Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think probably giving a bit of context to, to what happened briefly is that, as I said before, I went out for a I think it was February um, 2019, went out for a quick mountain bike ride to, um, to basically try a new bike and, um, and, and basically had a really bad crash. Uh, and then as a result of that, uh, probably spent four months in hospital. So uh, I had to go to St. George's for some emergency surgery, then some recovery, then I had to go to a, a rehab center called Stanmore. Uh, then I spent, I could, then I, in terms of moving back home, I couldn't move back to my house. So I then spent three months in living in the Ibis near Brighton Station while my house was adapted as well. So I finally came home. I'm just giving you this bit of context. I think it's important in terms of the impact it has. So I basically went out for a casual ride on, in sort of the 16th of February and I came home in September. So clearly that if you're you know, running a your own business and running a consultancy and your type of stuff that I do is like lots of coaching, lots of facilitation, that kind of stuff has a fairly kind of traumatic impact kind of on your on your business, on your clients. So, you know, you have to walk away from quite a lot of that kind of stuff. So, so <clears throat> big impact in terms of that, in terms of me, in terms of adjusting then, I think coming back, having left uh, Brighton as an able-bodied person and then coming back in a wheelchair, there's a huge uh, <clears throat> amount of adjustment involved in that. Uh, <clears throat> and I think the first one is, and it's, it's really funny because you know, once you're in a wheelchair, you you view Brighton so differently. You you, you notice things very differently. Um, and the first thing you notice is that you know, in terms of just the, the practicalities, I think uh, in terms of just getting around Brighton, you suddenly realise, notice that how how hilly. And I always knew Brighton was a really hilly place, and I knew that the pavements are all wonky and it's all a bit kind of. But actually, if you're in a wheelchair, all of a sudden, <laughs> these things are take significant more significant. So you realise that the first thing is that. In terms of be able to, you know, to live and work in Brighton, you're going to need some, unless you have like uh, guns of steel, which I clearly don't have, then you're going to need some kind of electric, um, electric wheelchair, electric attachment to wheel to help you to get around. Just in terms of the, the accessibility and getting around, you know, either to get to your place of work or to get to go and see clients, that kind of thing is kind of huge. Um, so that's kind of the, 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 the I think, the first thing that, that's key. Uh, so and, and also it's just recognizing those kind of things for a lot of people are quite expensive so for me to you know to buy a wheelchair and electric attachment was about eleven thousand pounds so it's kind of like there's quite a lot to you know i'm lucky that i had some my mountain bike friends did the um did it like a charity event for me and did the south downs win a day and managed to raise nine thousand pounds so i just had a couple but so there's a lot of money involved in it and at the same time, you know, adapting your house, there's huge, that's, there's huge amounts of uh, money involved in, in, in doing that as well. So in terms of just getting in and around, I think the other thing, so the first thing you kind of bump into is being able to get in and around right and home. And the second thing that you bump into is, I think is really issues around accessibility. So it's actually, what can I actually get into? And it's, you know, a lot of the like tech SMEs in Brighton, you know, have little offices here and then. I mean, some of them, some of the more modern ones are accessible, but a lot of the those older buildings just aren't accessible so you just physically can't get into places uh, which is um which makes life sort of really you know really complicated as well 
And I think also for people in wheelchairs as well, then you're into the whole issue of, uh, you know, if you can get access to a building and you're actually working within the building, you also then need to, you know, access to things like a disabled toilet. Uh, and if you haven't got one with the building, then you need to work out where the nearest one's in. So there's lots of these, and I know there's lots of real practical issues in terms of me, in terms of my adjustment to, to living and working in there, uh, which is, has been, yeah, it's been quite tricky. And I, I think I'm, I'm kind of gradually getting there. I think when I was at uh, Stanmore, they said, one of my questions was, how long does it take to men take the mental shift between being an able-bodied person to coming to terms with your sort of disability? And they said, it's about five years. And I remember then saying five years, I was like horror struck, but it could take five years, but anything could take five years. But actually I'm probably two and a half years into that journey is probably about right. So, so yeah, so that's just some, some insights. And it's interesting that I'd say that Actually, if you're returning to Brighton, you're trying to adjust to to being someone who has disabilities, someone who's in a wheelchair. Actually, a lot of the issues you've got are very practical issues in terms of just getting around, getting in, just living your life. And it's amazing that there aren't really any guides to, you know, I'm trying to find where there's a guide to what's accessible and what's not accessible. Yeah, they <clears throat> don't really exist. And the ones that do exist aren't very good, if I'm honest. So um, maybe that's something to do. That is fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing. Um, I, the whole thing about diversity really is, uh, Jonathan touched on as well, is that it's about empathy. It's about we as employers and leaders and, you know, community people doing stuff in our community. We, we need to sort of think more about people that aren't experiencing the world as we are experiencing. So any of us could become disabled at any point, um, you know, unfortunately. And, um, you know, I was just, when we had the rubbish strike recently for example i was just didn't really realize until i read something on facebook about somebody having to maneuver around brighton with all the rubbish in the streets you know or the fact that there's so many um cafes now you taking up room on all the pavements because of covid safety issues you know how do people maneuver around that in a wheelchair or if you're just using a cat you know all of these things mariam I think yes you know you're talking about we need to develop empathy but when it comes to diversity not everything is visible so sometimes for us to um if we see someone we know I don't know they're a person of color or they've got a physical disability that you can see um you've got a, 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 it's easy to be aware that there is a, a difference in them and um you can develop an empathy but I think a lot of us are diverse in many ways that people can't see. So I think in general, when you meet people, um, you know, it's it's important to note that. For example, you know, I'm neurodiverse. I've got uh, dyspraxia. And that might mean I look a bit cl clumsy or, you know, like cycling is ter terrifying or driving or certain things. But nobody would ever know that, you know, if they met me. And I, I have struggled with lots of things. Um, and people just wouldn't see that and know, and that makes you hesitant, even in, on a panel, when to speak, when not to speak. That's something that's very difficult for a dyspraxic. Um, or it could be that you've come from an underprivileged uh, background. And if you come from an underprivileged background, you know, your self, your, um, your feeling of self-entitlement can be very different to everybody else's. Um, and, um, and you can you know i'm speaking from experience you do have a limited mindset of quite often and you don't know what um what there is out there in terms of a career you don't know what you can do you don't know where you can be you just think i need to pay the bills and feed myself and that's that's your goal in life and um again when you're talk, talking about networks and trying to get jobs and climb the ladder and all of that when you come from an underprivileged background you don't know anybody who can give you a job in a senior position. It's always like the management team's friends, you know, um, children that get the, the work placement, etc. Um, and so I think there are invisible, um, there is invisible diversity within us, around us all the time that we're not conscious of. It's not just because you're female or a person of colour. And so I think developing that empathy at all times, understanding and being educated on what types of diversity there is in the first place can help. So 
and then um, sometimes you can start to see the signals if somebody is a little bit different um, and yeah. Thank you, Mariam. Um, one of the things that helps me is to look at what the arts uh, arts organisation are doing and universities are doing, especially around class. And I'm going to come to Michelle in a second as well to talk about a bit about neurodiversity. Um, that um, in their in their surveys, they don't just do the normal kind of diversity surveys that you see, like where you're ticking lots of boxes about your race and stuff. They also include a little section now around uh, thinking back to when you were about 14. The, like a formative, your formative years, what was the main breadwinner in your household doing at that time for a job? So that it gives a better picture for where you were at and what sort of um, education your family were having, you know, like what was your socioeconomic background rather than a kind of narrow view. And uh, so that helps sort of diversify the whole arts organisations and universities. So it's just different ways of thinking about diversity. Michelle, you were going to add to... Yeah, yeah. thanks, Rifa. I, I just really enjoyed what Mariam just said, because, yeah, I think um, there's two things. In, in my head, it's it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of coming to terms with, with a sort of ADHD and trying to kind of navigate that, and especially at work, and, you know, just being open about it, actually, because, um, you know, like any... Um, status you know it's something do I want to declare it do I want to identify is it important but I think it is actually I think it's important for people to realize that neurodiversity comes in many different forms it's not one shape for it um, and you know people that you work with might have similar struggles and you know it might help them as well and you can learn from others you know so ADHD means that you know sometimes it's a struggle to kind of work out at an executive level what what you're up to in a day <laughs> so you need to be very clear on your calendar and make sure that you're focused and it's it's quite yeah that, that side of things can be quite a struggle um what else was i going to say also like why diversity is important i don't think we've talked we've talked about empathy and why it's why it's great because you should be empathetic with people and you know it's more comfortable for everyone um but also having diversity like you, you mentioned sort of a difference in age even just something like that that just brings a, a different perspective to the problems that you're working on some of the meetings you're having are like coming from all different directions which is good right you need like a diversity of opinions and perspectives so that you can be creative with some of your solutions and, and I think you mustn't lose sight of that it's not just about being nice and being it's, it's a profit thing for your company <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Jonathan, you were going to comment as well. Yeah, hi. Um, so, yeah, it's just on um, sort of a continuation on Mariam's point around um, the sort of invisible um, issues um, around diversity, the, the, the unseen things. And um, I think it sort of comes back to my point earlier on that I, I sort of spoke about, which is about um, continuous learning mindset. And it's like if, if you embrace that, you, you, never be afraid to ask questions um, but ask them in, in an empathic way so i think the worst thing that we can do as leaders and as a society is not um not not ask the, ask the questions not learn about the person not learn about what makes them tick understanding their background because if we do that um we're just existing in smaller and smaller concentric circles of our own existence which makes us less inclusive um, and so it's about, you know, starting the conversation, speaking to people, understanding their backgrounds, because if you do that, you are armed with knowledge that will help you as a leader and as a general human being um, support other people and, and empower them. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, Marianne, we had another question about or a comment about neuro neurodiversity. Yeah. God. You know, in, in uh, Brighton, we're very creative, we're a, tech, a huge tech scene, and we're always innovating. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that is where I think sometimes neurodiverse thinking really comes in. So quite often our abilities go like this on a graph of what people can do and what they're good and bad at. And if you're neurodiverse, it goes like this. Mm -hmm. I would be really bad at something, really good at something, it goes like that. And when I started this job, um, I've never really talked about me being 
dyspraxia it runs my family the younger ones got tested the, us older ones it, they didn't do the testing in those days and I thought oh no I've started a new job it's a big really <laughs> big role they, they're going to test me with this sort of government work scheme thing and they're going to say I should be shoveling shit for a living and what am I going to do and it came up with the fact it told me what my job should be and he said my job should be a leader because I have empathy I can do strategy I can problem solve and I can innovate and I'm an excellent verbal communicator and it was interesting because you know Michelle talked about being neurodiverse and being on a on a board you know being in leadership team and I think it's quite it actually can be can be quite a common thing because um picking up patterns between disparate things is all often you can be brilliant at if you're neurodiverse like you'll do it in two microseconds you just pick up spot the trends and patterns so I think again it's um why hire somebody that's neurodiverse because we have superpowers are brilliant for innovation and collaboration in, in the tech sector that's fantastic thank you Mariam. on the wired sussex diversity toolkit we have a link to the government website which talks about uh, recommendations for all kinds of diversity stuff but it also has a really interesting section about different types of neurodiverse conditions is that the right uh, abilities um and yeah not seeing it as a kind of it's a strength sometimes as well but it's also playing to people's strengths and not trying to force people with certain um conditions into things that aren't you know right for them um before I come to Chris about a question about, um, I just wanted to, I've got a question from Michelle, for, uh, for Michelle from Helen Murdoch from uh, MPB. Um, she wants to know, do you think, what do you think employers can do to help someone who is coming out and going through their transition at work? Yeah, thanks Helen. I, I think that's a really good question. Mm. <laughs> I have to think back to when I came out and there was a discussion about trans people, which was um, somewhat, uh, you know, just joking kind of thing, a bit banter. And I got very upset and my manager just took me to one side and said, have we hit a nerve? And I said, yes, you know, I've come out, I'm, I'm trans, I'm coming out as trans. And he did all the right things from then on, actually. We had um, a meeting with HR and, you know, just talked it through. And I was, I was made aware that, you know, my job was not on the line for being trans. Of course it shouldn't be. Um, that they would support me and if I got any stick from anyone that you know that I should let them know so that's su that support was really important at a very simple level I think for for instance recruiting it's really good to say something like you know uh, we welcome all genders and uh, Reefa picked up on you know pronouns and things like that they all sound like small things that why should I do this but actually they do help people they're a signal really that people feel comfortable to apply to you because they you know you you, you feel that um you'll be welcome and then you know whilst you're um whilst you're in a job it's good if if there are resources or or people ask you questions i had one person kind of stop talking to me at a workplace um and that's what trans people sometimes encounter is a bit of ostracism uh, because they're different and then it's not always a, a a kind of mean thing it's just because someone feels a little bit like it's a taboo <laughs> uh, and and someone kind of cornered me in the kitchen and, and just said oh you know it's a bit of a taboo you know to talk about um trans and stuff isn't it and I just said no 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 it's my favorite subject so ask me anything <laughs> in fact someone um at the company I currently work with um is doing a um, ask me anything. They're taking over a, a kind of um, channel, a Slack channel, and doing an ask me anything on trans awareness because it's Trans Awareness Week, and that's lovely just to see that a company supports that and that there's people at work that are open. It's a big company, so there are other trans people at my workplace, and it's just yeah, all those kind of things where it's normalised and people are out and feel comfortable to be the authentic selves. And I think we all, whatever our sort of um, backgrounds, we all have have had opportunities for learning moments like that. And I certainly needed to learn a bit more about trans issues myself as a diversity champion and wanting to help lots of different groups. And there are things that you just need to go and do your own research and find out about. And Trans Pride is one of those places that has, you know, spaces for people to go and like ask those questions and 
and you know find a find a friend like Michelle to ask questions to isn't it Michelle <laughs> yeah a nice question so <laughs> obviously but yeah I think there's sometimes a defensiveness you know um I saw something on LinkedIn recently where someone was saying is everybody going to change their pro I would you do this one small thing and change your pronoun on your profile and somebody responded quite defensively saying well I don't I recruit on ability I'm not uh, bothered about people's gender I don't think you should put it on your CV da, da, da. and that's just a sort of a defensive response that a lot of us do have when we think we've done something wrong or that we're not doing the right thing and actually just finding out why that's important for trans is so important and um, just making sure that you're sort of being be, being there for others and with she says Brighton as well it's called she says so I knew that I had to like specifically say on our invites trans and non-binary people are welcome to our groups because we cannot assume anyone's reading your job ad and thinking that they're welcome you know and unconsciously feeling not welcome um i'm going to come to um a chris in a second but mariam you had um something else you wanted to add yeah just in um in like what michelle said um you know she said she needed support, she wants support and needs support from her company. Well, last year I was looking for a new job and I've had lots of jobs, I'm 42 now. And I just thought, you know what, what do I really value? You know, I'm always wanting to do exciting things. But I said, number one, I just want a supportive company that just will accept me and let me be me. Because I'm so tired of feeling like, you have to not you can't be you or tired as being a mother you can't get flexible working be, being this being that and it was I was just tired I thought how do I even find a new job because everybody says on their website oh D&I &I, diversity inclusion we really care but I thought how do I cut through that because I want to I want to genuinely want a company that cares about diversity inclu inclusion but I'm not going to believe a single thing I see on anybody's website which is why I think um seeing leaders in their personal life in, in in social media and things talking about and speaking about it made all the difference and, my, and in my company that I work for now um you know I'm one of the reasons I'm here is because one of the founders was, is incredibly passionate about diversity inclusion and was proactively looking to change the company so you know he was on his board a couple of years ago and just said you know white men of the same age group I'm bored he just said I'm really bored this is boring I don't want this anymore I don't want to come to another board meeting like this anymore I'm just bored and then proactively did everything he could to try and make the company as diverse as possible and it's it's pushed as something very important when considering any any hire in the company it's, it's really valued and that's why I'm in the position I'm in really it's so important. Thank you so much, Marianne. And that's it. People have got to step up, haven't they? They've got to say, right, we've got to do things differently. Chris, um, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I just wanted to add that. I mean, just to say that, you know, some of the work that I've done is about trying to help shape cultures. And I think that trying to shape cultures when you talk about diversity, but talk about diversity of personality and allowing people the space to bring them whole self to work, I think is really important. Uh, you know, I just think, you know, in terms of some of the things I've learned, you know, that you know if people can be you know in terms of i don't know this stuff, this is it's probably a bit like a bit of dad wisdom so i apologize in advance so but it's a bit like you know people can be almost the truest expression of themselves the happier they'll be i think trying to create cultures where people can really be themselves and be totally comfortable being themselves i think is so important for for everybody and that you can bring your whole self to work so uh, just totally like to you know back at that point i think it's so important I love that. Thank you. That is really, really important. I remember meaning conference always being around that kind of like that theme as well, you know, like bringing yourself to your whole self to work is so important. And that's why it links all of diversity stuff does link with with well being as well, because the stress, the level of stress of, you know, coming out at work, being the only non white person in the room, you know, being the only woman in the room, that all adds to like work is stressful enough as it is sometimes, you know, so without that added thing, I just wanted to um, pick up on Marianne's point as well about 
being a mum as well. So I'm not a mum and I often forget when I'm putting on events and stuff like early in the morning, late in the evenings that um, parents don't always have the childcare, um, you know, that that they need to go to evening events, for example. Was there anything, um, any of you want to add to it, like how you've helped uh, parents, in, especially during lockdown? Mar Mariam, you go. Well, I just like to say I am a mother and um, and I'm a single mother as well. Um, so it's really hard, you know, when, when you've got um, bosses who say you have to work overtime or to start up a business, you need to work 24 seven. You cannot do that if you're a single mother because you've, you're going to go home, cook the dinner and, you know, nurture a child. And on my experience of, you know, um, we all see like uh, women hit a glass ceiling. What happens? Um, well, when I was looking for jobs, you know, I, I got in um, um, to the top, just naturally to the top of um, top candidate list for some big jobs in um, my, the sector I'm in. And I will always remember last year that um, um, really before pro proper interview stage, there's a few, uh, the company just had never had a um, female really on its board for like 30 years. And, um, and was owned by a certain political newspaper and um <laughs> and they just said oh so well we offer zero flex I said the only thing I need is like a bit of flexibility for two days a week and they just said we offer you zero flexibility Mariam that was just like how we get wheedled out quickly you know it's like great that's it guess who was left you know four white males are left to, to do to do the job what was fantastic was that lockdown they didn't do remote working either and then lockdown happened two months later and guess what everybody needed that flexibility in remote working exactly it's all looking a bit old-fashioned isn't it if you're not <laughs> um jonathan you wanted to add about flexible flexibility yeah um so i'm i'm a father of three daughters um all, all under six um which is, it comes with its own challenges. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of, you know, obviously I know, I, I know and value um, what flexibility means for me, um, but as, a, as a, a leader and a boss, that's kind of come, you know, it's something that I can just take and, what, and where other people um, within the business, you should never assume that they feel comfortable um, you know, you might say, oh, we operate a flexible working mindset um, and way of working, but don't assume that they're going to embrace that um, because um, you, you need to firstly lead by example. So be flexible. Um, secondly, um, I think in the old way of working pre pandemic, you know, whilst we were uh, we and society were sort of nodding towards flexible working, there still was across the board in society this just kind of omnipresent kind of sense of presenteeism like you're measured based on time at desk nine to five that's your hours you work those and you deliver your output whereas actually one of the refreshing things that has come as you know a happy result of um the pandemic is that the the, rem the remote working sort of um sort of world now um, is that flexibility. People have proven um, that they can work remotely. They can be flexible. They can be trusted. Um, not that they needed to prove it, but it has been like a, an experiment in sort of mass sort of behavior across society. So people have proven they can do that. And so, you know, my advice to people is, you know, hire people that you're going to trust, then trust them, then give then trust them to do that job. Um, and you kind of, you, you, you measure their performance, not on, you know, are they there at their desk, you know, punctuality is more, can they, are they actually delivering the results? So if they're delivering the results and they're working the hours that suit them, then what's the problem? Um, and that's what I do. You know, I sort of do school drop-offs and I'm flexible. I'm in the office some days that best suit my personal circumstances and I'm working at home other days and I cut my day accordingly. And I, I, I hope my team will um, nod that I'm delivering, but uh, <laughs> the same applies to them so we we encourage the team to to, to be flexible um and i think that's uh, for me um a solid piece of advice i would give to other people running businesses is trust people um and actually sort of reinforce that flexible mindset yeah that's brilliant thank you um michelle you wanted to add something as well about job interviews <clears throat> oh yeah i just got just 
a comment that you know it's also during the job interview stage that that people with family commitments can sometimes lose out because they've got to prepare for the interview with a <clears throat> I don't know if anyone's had those kind of interviews for the technical tech companies where you've got to prepare a big um, problem solution and you know bring that to the interview or even during the interview having a kind of um, in your face kind of test which is terrible for app if you've got anxiety <laughs> I've seen people literally freeze um, so yeah I just wanted to point that out and, and you're a parent as well aren't you Michelle I am yeah yeah um, so you know yeah like we should be mindful things like at work you have things outside of hours maybe socials or um, even things like hackathons and stuff that you know, take a lot of people's time um, so we should be mindful of that, I think. I don't know what the exact answer is for these things because, you know, you, you need to test candidates and give them some problems to see how they work. But, you know, I'm trying to maybe foster this idea that, you know, maybe you you pair with them, maybe look at things together, review existing code. So it's not such a time drain on people, but you can still get an idea of their skill level. I think that the overwhelming theme is like as ma making... But seeing people as individuals and not just like kind of machines that we just keep going, going. Jonathan, did you want to add something? Yeah, it's just on the, the job interview um, aspect. Um, it's I guess it's uh, on being aware of other people's circumstances. Um, just when you're recruiting, especially especially juniors, for example, or people coming straight out of university, um, they might not necessarily have, um, you know, uh, a significantly healthy bank balance, for example. So, you know, don't be cognizant of that when setting up interviews. Does it have to be face to face? Do you, are you going to really sort of make them sort of book a train and travel three hours across the country to come and sit in an office and, you know, have an interview with you? Could that be done remotely? So be it's, since small things like that um, are important as well as, you know, taking the time to understand the, the circumstances of the individuals. Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. Um, I wanted to like we're coming to the, the end. I want to be one of those people that ends meetings early, if that's all right. With everyone. <laughs> because we're all time poor. You're all amazing leaders. And I want to get you back to like whatever it is that you're doing creatively and wonderfully today. Um, but Chris, um, you had some stats that you wanted to share um, around diversity. <clears throat> well, it was really it's just one. It was just. So when I was like prepping for this yesterday, I had one stat. Well, there's, I've got actually I've got loads of stats, but I'm not going to bore you with them. But the one that jumped out to me is that the, the he was saying some research was saying that there's about eighty five percent of employers want to do something about diversity, but only forty six forty six percent are actually doing something about it. And it struck me that that you know that diversity is an, and inclusion is is a subject that that creates a certain degree of anxiety. I think. Um, and, and it's a question of where you start with something like this. And I wonder whether there's, you know, people out there, who, you know, running businesses, you know, small tech, tech SMEs in Brighton who are thinking, well, I want to do something, but where do I start? I'm being incredibly nervous. And I think that I, one of the things that I noticed, so I was thinking, well, what would I do in this kind of situation? So I think there's a lot of resources out there. And certainly for, because my background's HR and uh, as part of that, I'm part of the member of the CIPD. Uh, and they have their own website, but they have, I actually had a look on their site and some of their stuff, I'm being really honest, isn't always great, but it was actually, this was actually really quite good. It's a very practical guide of things that you can do as a company and some background research to support that. So if anyone is thinking that, you know, I've wanted to do something about this for a while, but didn't know where to start. I think there's a, that, for, I think the CIPD is a, and it's a free resource. You don't need to be a member to access it. It's probably a good starting point of practical tips of what you can do. And I know, uh, Rupi, you're also talking about other resources like Wired Sussex and government resources as well, I think. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Chris. The more resources, the better. I always think, you know, it's not just uh, my, mine, it, um, the Wired Sussex one, which I put together, is has got lots of resources around uh, diverse images for, from stock libraries. It's got uh, what kinds of things you can put into a job um, descriptions. Uh, jobs and uh, jobs uh, job ads um, but I'm always looking for more resources to add to that as well so there must be something there might be something missing in there um, but that's on uh, the Wired Sussex uh, website 
but also there is a link to the government website as well, which talks about um, different things that you can do, around, especially around neurodiversity as well. Does anyone want to add anything, Ma Marianne? Yeah, I'd, what I would like to say is um, when it comes to, you know, hiring people, um, I'd like to address leaders out there. I'd like to say, be brave and take a risk. You know, um, I work in different countries, particularly countries in some countries, it's illegal to be homosexual in the countries we work in. And I recently, you know, had to hire somebody and, you know, um, you know, that person just had to say, you can't send me to those countries because we did go to those countries. And I was like, and I had to take a real risk in most of the countries we operate, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing. And I just thought, oh, what am I going to do? Because it's going to be practically, it could be practically inconvenient. Or even um, even with women, you know, you've got to have them in separate rooms. We, we've got diverse workforce. We have to accommodate for the logistics of doubling the costs for different rooms and accommodation in some of the countries we work in. And I, I thought, right, Mariam, all about diversity, inclusion, Mariam, blah, blah, blah. But when I'm actually faced with, do I hire somebody that is where it's illegal to be them in the countries we operate in? I felt the fear and I felt like nervous. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm doubting myself. I'm worrying. I'm getting stressed. I, I don't know how to make this decision. And in the end, you know, I hired somebody. He's probably going to be my best hire I've ever made in ever, I reckon. But you've got to, you know, all of us, even if we are diverse, there's there's lots of diverse diverse isms that we could have. Um, it's hard for all of us. And as leaders, we have to take risks and we will feel the fear. But I would just say we need to be the change. You know, we need to just do it. Fantastic, Marianne. I um, want to just say that we've also got at Wise Sussex the Skills and Talent Manifesto, which any companies can sign up to. We had over 70 companies sign up to it back in 2019. And it's part of the manifesto is to make sure that we're creating these spaces for people to thrive in our industry. Um, Natalie Burns from United Us also wrote an amazing blog post about what they're doing at their company. If any of you want to, to contribute, do write something down for us as well. It all helps inspire that we're all on a journey together. We're all trying the best that we can. And that, um, you know, there are simple things that we can do. Um, and I just wanted to end really that um, one, someone that has posted, Beth says, I'm adoring this panel conversation. It's wonderful to see and watch these empathetic, supportive leaders across our sector, we're in good hands. I just want to share that with all of you. And thank you so much, Marianne, Chris, Jonathan, and Michelle for giving us your time and expertise. And I'm sure people would love to connect with you and to hear more about what you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Rifa. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.